the end of the day, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. It's about what you've done with those accomplishments. It's about who you've lifted up, who you've made better. It's about what you've given back. Denzel Washington. Welcome to Inspire Vision. Our sole purpose is to elevate the lives of others and to inspire you to do the same. Hey, Jay, welcome to the show. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. So where about you located? So I am currently in Palma Sola, Florida on the Gulf Coast. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> you're, you're in warm weather. It is a beautiful, sunny day. Oh, that's great. Well, listen, I'd love for you to share with your audience. I find it always fascinating, the history uh, behind what motivates an individual to do what they're doing at present time. And so I'd love for you to share with the audience kind of what, what brought you to this point of writing books and doing these types of things and being that meditation mindset coach and hypnotherapist, all those kind of things. So I was um, a child with not a typical childhood. As far as we look at America today, I was raised in the 70s by a mother who unfortunately at that time when parents got divorced they just gave children to the mothers they didn't really take a look at what might have been in the best interest of the child so i was raised by a drug addict and an alcoholic who was trading my body to drug dealers for drugs so i was basically what we now call sexually trafficked starting around the age of two wow. and it wasn't until I was five years old and taken by a neighbor to a vacation Bible school that I looked up and I saw a picture on the wall. And I told the woman as I was gluing toothpicks to the little milk carton making my little church, I said, I know that man. And she said, oh, yes, of course, that's Jesus. I said, I don't know his name. I just know he's the man that sits in the corner and cries when the bad men are hurting me. So I didn't have a typical raising and I escaped into books. I read a lot of books to escape what I was living. And my father did, my biological father finally got custody of me when I was 11 and a half. And yes, I did do therapy and, and we tried to create a normal childhood for me but I wouldn't call it normal because I started acting and singing and modeling and being on stages and being in commercials. And, and, and it was a lot of fun, but I think I was just hiding and masking pain. And so after being in some not wonderful relationships, since I couldn't fix mommy, obviously I decided to do a missionary dating expedition and date boys with drug and alcohol problems. So I ended up in a yoga class at a shelter for abused women and children when I ended up there. And I vowed to give back by volunteering one day after I became a certified yoga teacher. And so I wanted to volunteer to help others learn to have peace within themselves and use their own breath for that. Because I know, I've spoken to many people over the years, I could have taken a similar route as my mother. I could have, because of the abuse I endured, become a drug addict or a prostitute. But instead, I found how to yoke my breath to Jesus and to God. And so then I started to teach group and private yoga classes and then become a Christian yoga therapist. And I then became a certified mindfulness meditation teacher and all of the coaching that I've been doing is based on self-regulation principles because honestly, when you've been abused, no matter what age, you have a hard time finding your breath, recognizing that you can breathe, and you become into this constant state of fight or flight. And I have found that yoga helps me and meditation helps me as an important piece of self-care for me. And I didn't want to just keep it to me. I wanted to share it. And honestly, rather than wallow in self-pity, I wanted to inspire others. 
So there you go. And then you wrote a book. And well, it's funny because I wanted to write a book. I was actually thinking about this recently. I had written it, you know, goals and dreams. What's the difference when you write it down, right? And I wanted to publish a book by the time I was 35. However, life was happening and different things in life kept happening. So it never happened. And I am ex super excited because it all like it all fell together. My this my first book was published just two weeks before I turned 51. And then because I was writing two other books at the same time, not sure how this should all be. A week and a half ago, my publisher put my second book, which is actually a letter to my 21 year old son in print. So now I have two books in less than four weeks. And oh. I'm ecstatic because they are similar but different. And I love the fact that I now have these two different audiences that I can hopefully inspire. Well, and I know the first one is Feel, Heal and Reveal, right? I don't know what the second one is because it just got published. <laughs> Um, I can tell you that Heal, Heal, and Reveal is definitely the journey that I have been on for essentially 51 years of finding emotional independence. I have learned, and I know that many people, whether it be because of trauma or because of just where they found themselves in life, you can physically remove yourself from an abusive situation or an unsafe situation, but you're not emotionally immediately healed it doesn't happen there is a well there's just numerous things that your body has gone through if you've been in a trauma state long enough there's a beautiful book called the body keeps score and unfortunately the way our bodies work we end up in physical dis-ease and so the, this book was it, it was a uh, it was a passion project because I took the he said, she said out. There's nothing in there about the relationships I've been in. And I'm not telling my specific story. I'm really giving a guide to anyone, be it a teenager, a dad, a mom, grandma. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. If you realize that you are emotionally still tied to something, that you don't want to be there's this ebb and flow and there are steps forward and back that you can take to help you find emotional independence and so, okay, it's, so it's my journey okay great and you know you mentioned yoga then you mentioned yes. meditation mindset and yes you know i think a lot of people me included you know until i started doing some more of these interviews it's like you know what I can't do yoga. I, I just don't do yoga well. You know, I, I can't even kneel down really without my knees hurting, so I'm not able to do yoga. But many people think that yoga is strictly the physical movement and that type of thing. And I, now I'm learning, and you can even elaborate this a bit, that yoga also includes kind of the type of meditation. So when, when you talk about yoga and you talk about meditation, are you talking the same thing or are they separate but similar? I would say separate from but similar, and I think it's up to the individual. So for me, I believe that yoga is your breath. I mean, that's the bare bones. Everyone can do yoga because we all breathe. Okay. And so you can, <laughs> if there's physical limitations to your body, you can still do yoga. I taught chair yoga and I've taught to people, individuals in wheelchairs, because what the mind sees, the body believes. So if I'm sitting in the chair and I'm lifting my arms and breathing, and you are sitting in a chair or in a wheelchair, and even if your arms cannot physically move, as long as you're taking that inhale and that exhale, you are putting your body into a beautiful state. And as you've changed your state, you can change your mindset. And as you change your mindset, you can literally change your life.
Okay, so let's talk about mindset. And obviously, you can do the same thing with meditation. Let's talk about mindset. What is your definition of mindset? And why is it so important that someone develop that to its highest potential level? I really think that mindset is a part of finding congruence or agreement between the conscious and the unconscious mind. There are many things that we do breathing, our heart pumping blood, knowing to move away from a hot stove. There's all these things that you can involuntary and voluntarily do. But your mindset is incredibly powerful for healing as well as just for daily survival. But see, I want to take it a step further. I don't want to just survive. I want to be a thriver. So if I'm going to thrive, then I have to make sure that I am at my purpose. And if I'm going to be at my purpose, then I can't be someone who's wallowing in self-pity. And therefore, the best way I have found is, you know, people always talk about how many muscles does it take to smile versus frown? Well, your, your, your mindset is essentially in its own right a muscle. And so by exercising your mind and adjusting your mindset with the power of not just positive thinking, but yoga and meditation. You literally can change your own self and then that ripple effect changes the world. Well, and you know, what I find interesting when we talk about mindset and you mentioned it, you know, mindset is a, a, a complete awareness. You know, so often we find people experiencing life from subconscious unconscious experiences that they had as children and you know all of those types of things and they don't realize that what they are experiencing is merely a reflection of those unconscious or subconscious experiences beliefs etc and if i'm understanding what you're saying correctly mindset allows us to be aware of that so when a situation occurs and those emotions start to come up our mindset we're able to recognize that oh that's that's a past thing that isn't necessarily um any part of my life anymore and you can move that aside and as you say then start with the more positive affirmations and thoughts and so on and so forth am, am i fairly accurate on that based on your opinion yes yes you are because here's the thing I, I think that a lot of times in our current society people take a look at sensitivity as a weakness so you might get lumped in if you're someone who exudes a positive mindset that oh, that's an empath or all these different like labels that they want to put on people. And then limiting beliefs come out of that. And if you have limiting beliefs, then your mindset becomes limited. And so I really want to encourage people and inspire people to understand that sensitivity is a source of power. It's not a weakness. And once you understand how you interact with the world and the people in it, well, then you have this incredible privilege of being able to cultivate environments and relationships that honor your sensitivity rather than demean it. And so you create these healthy boundaries within yourself by giving yourself unbelievably beautiful attention by just sitting in meditation or exercising within the forms of yoga and you become an individual that has the power to not just believe in yourself, but to allow others to see this person is different. Maybe I want to be like that too. Yeah, and I mean, you have had so many traumatic things happen to you in your childhood, and even as an adult, you've had some tremendous child, or some tremendous events that have really potentially could have affected you in such a negative way. Now, you know, I know as I was looking at your bio, three children on earth, three in heaven. Can you talk about that a little bit and how you were able to overcome the loss and the trauma? that could have potentially really defined who you are? I will say that because of my own childhood, a top goal, a top priority was when I get older, 
I'm going to be a better mom than my mom was. Well, the bar wasn't set that high, <laughs> but <laughs> I was frightened to become a mother. What if it's ingrained in me? People talk about generational trauma and all these things. Like, what if I am just automatically this horrible mom? And my father has now, he's been in heaven almost 20 years, but before my, well, I guess it's been almost 16 years, but before my oldest son was born, he told me, he said, all you have to do is the exact opposite of your mother and you'll do great. And I was like, oh, that's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> and my first son was born. And unfortunately, because of the person I had chose to be with for the rest of my life, it didn't work out that way. We weren't together for the rest of our lives. And we were actually separated before I, well, at around, I was six months pregnant at the time. So my son came into the world with just me and a little tiny support system, a little village of those who love me. And a few years later, I did find someone else and we got married. And unfortunately, there was a, um, a miscarriage and that was very devastating to me. And there were things going on in life and I already had a young one. So you just pick up and you go. And I didn't really grieve at all. I'll be very honest. Then when my second son was born, it was like, ah, oh, the rainbow child. And, and you move forward and now you have two children and you're going and you're going. And then I suffered a second loss of a child. And it was kind of the same situation. I did have a little bit of advice from someone in, in a Christian world that told me to write a letter to God and ask him to accept these two children and, and, and love on them until I can get to heaven. Okay. I'll say that might've been helpful. And I kept going in life. And then with my third son, he was actually a twin, but because of the shooting in Las Vegas in 2017 and the, uh, the challenge that I had there, I ended up with a staph infection from the shooting and I was bedridden and I ended up losing one of the twins. And you, you were harder? you 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 were there yes. in Vegas and literally a part of experiencing yes. that shooting. Yes, um the, the best we can figure the there was a young girl who got shot right in front of me and her two friends the bullet went through her abdomen two friends picked her up and they ran off and it sounded like a bee sting it felt like a bee sting but there was so much chaos i wasn't aware that the blood on my white shirt was my own and that my ear had what what seems to be the conclusion that we've all drawn is that the the bullet from her body uh grazed the corner of my ear and it, it looked like cauliflower, like a boxer's ear by the time uh, the lockdown was over and I was able to get home. And, and then when I ended up in the ER, they were like, well, we got to clean this wound and here's some antibiotics. And those were obviously too strong for my body with being pregnant. Uh, and then it wasn't long after that, that my body decided that one of the twins was not going to stay in my body. But that wasn't the end because then it was like this the blood mixture apparently was not good. And I ended up with a staph infection and, and it just, it took almost six months, almost the whole rest of the pregnancy for my body to truly try to find itself um, in a state of healing. And it wasn't done because after my youngest was born, it wasn't postpartum depression. It was like all of this loss and all of this trauma I had ever experienced was just coming into it, like a firestorm all at once. And that is when I learned that I had developed an autoimmune disorder that had kind of blossomed from all of these experiences, but it was just the shooting was the, 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 the final straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. Yeah. And there was, it, it was at least, um, I would say close to two years of, emotionally not feeling proper, physically not feeling proper and going through numerous diagnoses and medical things. And nobody could really say what exactly was wrong with me. 
And at that time, I was trying to finally finish my yoga certification so that because I thought, you know, my mindset was if I help others, then it's going to help me. And I did start to teach, but I was still struggling health wise. And I finally, I I got to a doctor who told me, you're not going to make it. Your body is shutting down your, your oxygenation levels and your this and your that in terms I didn't really understand because pretty much by the time my son was four, she is saying to me, get your will in order. And I'm like, wait a minute, I have three boys. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I am trying to end a very toxic relationship. And I, I don't want to leave this earth yet. I'm not done. I know there's a purpose to my life. So that is, honestly, it's a gut-wrenching feeling. And it was a very powerful wake-up moment to me that the body really does keep score and that the longer I kept reacting instead of responding to things in my life, there wasn't going to be much life left. And I had to find a way to replenish my inner strength, remind myself of my value and reinforce my resilience and fix this. Because if the medical field was going to give up on me, that's a big shock. So oh, what yeah. was I going to do? And, and that's really, um, I would say in the, that, so that was August of 2022. And that's basically when I had to have a come to Jesus moment with myself and be like, okay, what do I do? And that's kind of where I felt like, Hey, you know what? It's a mind body spirit connection that keeps us healthy. And the yoga is great. And meditation is great. And eating healthy is great. But there's some way that it all needs to kind of come together and you need to really focus on your health and your wellness in a different way. And that's where I, that's when I found hypnotherapy. I had used it way back in college after being raped. And that helped me go back to that little two, three, four, five year old girl and be like, hey, it's not your fault. You're, you didn't do this. You weren't a bad girl. The things that happened to you weren't your fault. And I thought, well, hey, it worked then. Maybe it could work now. And honestly, that's the journey that led to the book was because I found that by creating hypnotic suggestions or placing hypnotic suggestions into the meditations that I recorded for myself about my own health, about my blood, about my lungs, about the systems in my body that were challenged, all of my blood markers in six months came back to normal ranges and I'm in what they call spontaneous remission now. And that was kind of the light bulb that went off of like, I'm sharing this with my friends. I'm writing meditations for friends. I'm helping friends lose weight. I'm helping friends do this. And then someone's like, there's a better platform. PJ, you've got to figure out a way for more people to know how they can help themselves than just, you know, these little things you're doing. And, it was kind of like when in a meditation state, I came out and I thought, oh, yeah. remember that girl who wanted to be a writer? Remember that girl? She's still there. And I really furiously in one weekend put Feel, Heal and Reveal together without the last chapter. I wasn't quite sure how it ended. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm going yeah, to interrupt you for a minute because... Sure. What I find interesting, and, and I think it's important for the audience to understand this, that meditation with mindset and with a purpose, and as you say, you actually recorded your own meditations, I would assume, with music and then, you know, your affirmations, whatever that was. People need to understand that miracles are happening healing is occurring because of meditation and people are doing it in different ways you know which is fine but the reality is if they're focusing in a very specific way or if they're getting those guided meditations that are focusing in a very specific way that 
healing is occurring and the body literally can heal itself as a matter of fact as you were just saying our experiences of the past can literally affect our health and the way to turn that around is to become aware mindset wise and then go through that process of meditation and allow that to literally change our lives and it can and and i think a very huge key to that is to understand that it's not a linear journey though it's not going to happen just one meditation and i'm done yay i'm healed now no life itself is filled with highs and lows there's a lot of discoveries there's a lot of challenges and with each step that you take towards finding yourself in a place where you can maybe just do one minute and then five minutes and then a week later, you're doing 10 minutes of meditation. You're going to lead yourself towards having a more authentic and more fulfilling life. So when you honor yourself and you let meditation guide you to becoming the most authentic version of yourself, that's a journey that's well worth embarking on. And healing from the impacts of whatever it's been in your life. It's a profoundly personal journey. No one human being can tell you exactly what you need to do to fix everything. You have to find your way back to yourself. And it's piece by piece. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be moments where you question if you've made any progress. But again, healing isn't linear. Each step forward, no matter how small, is a victory. And as long as you keep the mindset that life is full of victories, then true healing emotionally, physically, in all different directions can occur because you, you it's, it's these limiting decisions, it's these limiting beliefs that we allow to creep in and then we hold on to it like it's the gospel, it's such truth and it's not. And that is honestly, <sighs> I think it truly started with forgiving myself. Yeah. So let and me ask you a question. I know you created, are, are you talking about this self-regulation technique of paper elephants method, or is that something entirely different? No, I mean, it started with paper elephants because I needed something quick and easy with when life comes thunderstorming at you. So it's a 30, 60, 90 second self-regulation so that no matter where I am, at a red light, at the grocery store, if something triggers me, which is what I think a lot of us suffer from if you've been traumatized, small little things, a car backfiring can throw me to the ground because it reminds me of a gun going off. So um, someone, even my own child, lifting his arm to like show me a piece of paper of something he drew will create in me every little you know all the physical reactions of the fact that i'm about to get hit and you're never you can't predict when those things in life are going to happen and so it was out of trying to write yoga sequences and beautiful meditations that the paper elephants method was born so that i could have this little tool for self-regulation and when i started sharing it to other people and they were like wow yeah this is really great this, this helped me focus on myself for just this brief second, get my breath back and get out of fight or flight. And now it's become a daily part of my life. So what is it exactly? Describe what it is. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm out um, in the public and all of a sudden something triggers me and I'm feeling that emotion just rush up, the negative emotion just rush up. What do I do? So... Let me, can I give you 60 seconds of your time? Can I take it from you for a second? Sure. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask you, please, Dr. Doug, to just take a moment and imagine all of your negative thoughts, the things that you have told yourself, the things others have told you, and imagine them and visualize them. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable. And imagine little origami paper elephants. And okay. as you inhale, 
Set those paper elephants on fire with your strong breath. Breathe in deeply through your nose and send your breath like a blazing fire to your forehead. And as you exhale, sweep away all the ashes of those paper elephants, which are no longer strong enough to take hold in your mind. Again, okay. breathe in through your nose, set the remaining paper elephants on fire, and as you exhale, you blow those ashes away, clearing them away, so there's only room for love and happiness to fill your forehead. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, you know, and again, that really is kind of having that mindset, having the ability to recognize it's coming up to do that, you know, to do that paper elef elephant method and really recognize what they are, burn them, you know, blow them away. That's where the mindset comes in. So, so here's the question that comes to my mind right now is, how does someone develop that type of mindset? Because most most people, I would say, uh, is that when those emotions come up, they just are affecting us. And how do we get to the point where we've developed the mindset to when those emotions come up, we are conscious enough, we're aware enough that we go, okay, here's the emotion. I need to apply the paper elephant method. The biggest essential piece is forgiving yourself because you're going to slip up. You're going to react instead of respond. And you're sometimes more often than not going to react in a way that you might regret. You have to know that change is a process. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be victories. And what matters is your commitment to your growth and your willingness to learn from each and every encounter. You have to just simply understand that every day you can wake up and be like, oh, I'm so glad I'm alive. The sun is shining. Or you can wake up and be like, oh, it's raining again. Uh, I don't even want to get out of bed. But it's a choice. Life is filled with choices. And as you navigate through the complexities of life and relationships with people, that choice that you have to respond rather than react is a powerful act of self-love. It's an affirmation of your worth and your capacity to rise above all of the negativity. You embrace your practice of self-care, of meditation, of your mindset with kindness and courage. And you just basically end up getting to watch the world transform for the better. Well, and I okay. love that, you know, you, you mentioned, and I think it's so true, and I've heard different philosophies that say the same thing, or different words that say the same philosophy. We are either at the effect of our environment and our emotions, or we are at cause over. We can be acted upon, or we can act. And what you what you're really saying is that, you know, we all have the ability to move away from that affect situation and literally be at cause over our emotions and over our life, over our health, over all of that. Absolutely. And, and I find, you know, people, they, everybody gives it different words. We could argue about semantics, but there's no point. Moving forward, all you have to do is remember the importance of setting intentions. And they're not just mere wishes thrown into the wind, but they are powerful affirmations of your directions and your desires. Intentions become like a compass that guides your steps, ensuring for the individual that even when the path gets foggy, rainy, thunderstorms come in, hurricanes, you name it, you have a sense of where you're headed and you can find your path. If you know your path, you stay on it. And if you take a couple steps back, just go forward again. Celebrate each and every victory. And that honestly has been 
I wish, I wish that I had published a book at 35. I wished I'd had the knowledge of what I have at 51 when I was 17, but I didn't. And there yeah. is no point to beating myself up over it. It's like, forgive yourself, keep inhaling, keep exhaling, keep moving forward. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you, something's coming to my mind. I'm going to ask you what might be considered a controversial question, because I know that, you know, as you've talked about yoga, guided by God's grace, you know, so you're very much Christian, and I get that, okay? So, so here's the question I have for you as we start to talk about cause and effect. I observe, uh, and I'm in Thailand right now, all right? So I'm observing a lot of Buddhists who go to the temple, who pray, who, you know, Buddha himself said he's not a god, but I know that they're praying for blessings. Uh, and certainly as Christians, we will pray for blessings. And so many times I've heard the comment, God's not hearing my prayers or he's not answering me or why would he let that happen to me? So here's my question based on your experience and even your faith, because I respect that. How do we help people to understand, and here's my opinion, <laughs> how do we help people to understand that we have a personal responsibility. We can't just give it over to someone else to take care of it, even if we consider that it's God. But we have a personal responsibility to take care of these things. And that's part of why we're here on this earth. I, for most of my life, especially, you know, since being five years old and, and understanding exactly who Jesus was as the best of a five year old. I've come to believe and share with others that God answers prayers in three ways. It's yes, no, or wait. If he says yes, it's because you are ready and that you have become the responsible, mature individual to accept whatever it is you've been asking for. If he says no, you may or may not be doing what it takes to accept that gift and use those blessings in the manner that would be beneficial for the world. It might not be ecological for you to have that because you may not know what to do with it, or you may be compromising other people in the process. And if God says, wait, then it's, you have some growth to do. You have some lessons to learn. And then when that process has been completed, if you want to keep asking, you might get that. Yes. You're looking for. But to me, it's broken down in yes, no, or wait, because we have been, in my opinion, given the free choice, free will, and you have choices that you need to make. And it's quite possible because I've done it. I've stuck myself back in a negative relationship because it was easier and comfortable than to move forward. The physical independence was the easy part, but the emotional part, the emotional independence hadn't come. So I thought, well, might as well just go back into it. But that wasn't the best choice for me. And then I'm looking around wondering why all these negative things are happening. But I want to have a beautiful, resilient spirit. I want to thrive and not just survive. So I've come to believe that when I'm praying for something or I'm asking for something, if the blessing isn't coming yet, I need to take a look at what are my choices? Where have I put myself? Where have I put my kids? What is it that I'm not doing to help make the world a better place? Well, and you know, well you know, what comes to my mind is in the New Testament that, uh, you know, we're saved after all we can do. And so people, you know, now you're only saved by grace and other people say, no, there's these actions. I look at that and it's going, no. And you just hit it on the head until you have done that self work, that self introspection, until you've raised yourself up to the level of being able to put out that energy and frequency to receive, you won't receive. But once you've gotten yourself to that point, guess what? It naturally comes because now you are there to receive. And I think that's where the meditation with with the affirmations, uh, you know, with that, with all of that occurs to where, as you said, and I love what your description was, when you get to the point that you're able to receive it, it will come. I think that a lot of people, 
if you if you don't have a, a faith in God or some sort of higher power, it might just be your gut feelings. And your gut can be a very powerful guide. And I believe that your gut will whisper truth to your heart. And you just have to learn to acknowledge it. Trusting yourself is a huge first step towards recognizing when to hold on to something or when to let go of it. Our emotions and our instincts should be our guideposts, no matter what your faith is. And they warn us when we're heading down a bad path into dangerous waters. And if we ignore them, it can lead us down a path where our needs and our safety is compromised. Well, and you get into the quantum field and, you know, there, there's a big push right now in meditation, at least dive experiences, to where they focus on the quantum field and being able to get into that energy, those frequencies and so on and so forth. And I look at that and it's like, you know what, it's all the same thing. You're you're trying to get to the point where you are communicating with whatever your belief system allows you to communicate with or with whom. And as you tap into those frequencies and those energies, that that's when you start to raise yourself up to the point that you're able then to receive those very things that you are hoping for or you've been asking for. Yeah, absolutely. It requires acknowledging that you might not know something or you might know something and you might feel something that's profound with any, without any factual evidence to back it up. And so when you recognize either that sinking feeling or that lifting feeling in your gut, you might need to follow it. And I think that that's the, it's the problem. People don't trust themselves anymore. They're looking for all in all these other places for answers instead of within themselves. Well, that's right. And, you know, as we close, I would love for you to share with the audience as, as you think about it, what would be a message that you would really love to share with the audience as we close? I feel that a lot of people out there are just pushing for survival, but there's more to it. Surviving is like inhaling and not exhaling. You're going to blow up. Thriving is the true essence of healing and empowerment. So with each boundary you set, it becomes a brick in that foundation of having a beautiful, resilient spirit. Thrivers are the ones lighting the way for others with our shared experiences and our newfound wisdom. And I encourage everyone, read my book, find your own sense of how to thrive because we need you to help light the world. Oh, I love that. And so the book, Feel, Heal, and Reveal, can be found where? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, most of your online retailers have it. And again, this is for finding emotional independence, no matter what you've gone through in your life, physically removing yourself is not enough. Okay. And if people want to learn more about what you do personally and how you might be able to help them besides the book, how do they find you? The easiest way is the word V T H E P J Victor V I C T O R dot com. The P J Victor dot com. You'll find all of the things I'm involved with nonprofit wise, other books I'm writing and have written what we do as a family to help the world, because it's not just me. I've got three boys that I'm raising to be world changers. Uh, that's wonderful. PJ, thank you so much for being on the show. It, it has just been great. I really appreciated your thoughts and, and all the things that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me again. I just appreciate the platform that you give others and so that we can try to inspire and change the world it makes a difference and folks thanks for listening hope you enjoyed it and and please tune in again and you know what get that book feel heal and reveal and if you feel like it, it can be applicable it certainly is worth reading thanks again have a great week uh, look forward to having you join us again soon